turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. I'm going to continue a sermon that I started last week that is a continuation of our sermon series, sermon series entitled, What's Up With That? And the idea behind this series is to dive a little deeper into issues that we may have taken at face value. Truths, if you will, and I'll kind of throw quotations up on that because a lot of times there are things that we've heard in church that maybe not be a biblical mandate. We've, we've taken them as truth. We live them out. They may be a good thing, but they may not necessarily be a biblical thing. And what we tried to do as a church ever since we launched this, we wanted to run everything that we do, our hearts, to chase after God with all that we are, but to run a biblical mandate church in the sense that everything we do flows out of the heart of Scripture. That it's His Word that sets us free. It's His Word that He says will not return unto me void. It's the Word that will change you. It is miraculous. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. On one side, it redeems and it sets free. On the other, it judges. And we have to make certain that we rightly divide the Word of truth. Amen? The reality is, however, that oftentimes we've been very cavalier about what we talk about. And we will throw out something. And you, as a, as a child of God, I want to tell you that every time you hear a preacher preach a message, you need to go back into the Word and you need to temper that with everything that he or she says according to the Word of God. We talked last week about a parable. This is the wheat and the tares. I'm not going to read all the verses, but it gets down to one point, and it says this. It says, do you want us that the servants are speaking, asking about the weeds that are among the wheat harvest? And he says, do you want us to go in and gather them up? He's saying, do you want us to go in and pull up those weeds that have entangled themselves around the harvest of wheat? But he said, listen to this. No, lest while you gather up the tares or the weeds, you will also uproot the wheat with them. And then here's our, here's our mandate. Here's what we have to align ourselves with as a child of God. Remember the wheat, that is you, the child of God. You're growing. You're going to be beneficial. You become, if you will, if I can use the metaphor, you become the food, if you will, by sharing God's word in and through your life. The Bible says, he who hungers and thirsts after righteousness, he will be filled and we are the hands and the feet of Jesus as we live out our faith. People begin to feast on the glory of God through what they learn and hear and see through us. Very important that you understand that. The, the tear or the weed is anything or anyone that kind of presents an antithetical side to that story whereby it begins to entangle and to choke out what God's trying to do. When I say that, I many of you can get in your mind maybe a person that is that in your life. That negativity, that hatefulness, that hurtful, that cruel person that is just choking out the life of everything you're trying to be as a child of God. And you know that they exist. And maybe we've come to the place where we're like, God, just, just take that person out from in front of me that I can live out my faith. Maybe it's not a person. Maybe it's a thing. Maybe it's an ideology. Whatever it may be. Maybe it's a job. And God is saying, listen, if I tear out, he said, if you gather up the tears, then you also unroot, unroot the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first go and gather the tares. Bind them into bundles and burn them. And then bring the wheat into my barn. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, pray that you would change lives today through your word and through your mandate. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. I called the message last week, haters are going to hate. How many of you know that's true? They're doing exactly what they're supposed to do. The world is always going to respond in a manner that is natural. It's a natural flow. The Bible even talks about two ways in this life. There's a broad way, and the Bible says, many there shall go in, and that way leads into destruction. Notice the word there, go, that they would just literally walk, and they will find that particular pathway. But then he said, then there's a narrow way. Few there shall find it. Notice the different words. You can go and just walk right into the broad way. The narrow way is, takes an effort on your part to look for and to find and to pursue it. Same is true with the world. The world is going to be hateful. The world is going to be cruel. If somebody's not in Christ. If somebody's not a child of God, they're just going to react that way. Then that doesn't imply that everybody that's not a Christian is a, is a bad person. That's not true. In fact, how many of you know that sometimes some of the most cruel people you'll ever meet are the people in the church? 
I don't get any joy in saying that, but I, I think there's something we can learn from that. Because whatever's in here is coming out of our mouth. Whatever's in our heart is going to come out as we live our faith in this, in this life. If we're hateful, then we have a hateful spirit and a hateful heart. But if we're lovers of Jesus, then by default we have to also be lover of people. Haters are going to hate. What will you do? How will you respond? How will you respond in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the area of people around you, in camping around you that are hateful, that are the weeds? You're that weeds. You're that hope. You're the bread of life. I know Jesus is the bread of life, but watch this. When I live out my faith and I love the unlovable and I forgive the unforgivable and I extend a hand to the broken, a hand up, if you will, watch this. I begin to point people to Jesus, and they feast on that, and the righteousness of God is extended to their life, and they they're the ones forever changed. But you got to make time for people. So what will you do? Last week we kind of broke it down, and I had four points that I wanted to give you, and I'm going to unfold these first three very quickly. It's just by way of review. Who are these haters? First of all, understand most people who are hateful and hurtful and cruel are people just like you and I. But they've been hurt along the way. Somebody defamed them. Somebody hurt them. I can tell you how many times in churches I've, I mean, in church life as a pastor that I've spoken to someone and said, hey, man, do you have a church home? No, no, I don't want any part of that. Why, why, why not? Can you, can you explain that to me? Yeah, man, I was, I was so mistreated in church. I dig a little deeper. Was that, does that mean you didn't like the color of the carpet? You didn't like the song? You didn't, you know what? You didn't like the, no, no, no. And then maybe they'll unpackage a true situation that broke their heart, something that never should have happened to them. And then as a representative of the church, I've got to own that. I have to, I have to own it for the church. I can't defend it because it's reality. So I say, you know what? It's unfair. It's sad. It's tragic that that happened in your life. But can I tell you something? You have to go in shalom. You have to go in peace, which is a word from the Hebrew culture that says, go, and not only do you go in peace, but you go no longer holding. Watch this, church. Everything that happened to you back there, you can no longer hold that against everybody else that you meet in the future. If you're going to give him praise, go ahead. Amen. Here's the reality. Hurt people hurt people. And so what I found to be true in that, who these people are, they are people that have been hurt. They are people that have, have lost the sight of contentment. They are people who, watch this, and I believe this, they do not like what you have. Jealousy, pride, the root of most all hatefulness in this life. Secondly, not only who these people are, but what, what can I do? And I told you last week, first thing you need to understand is you do not engage their behavior. Somebody's being hateful. You don't have to be hateful back. Man, you're just feeding that thing. And it's going to grow, and it's going to morph into something even bigger. I said this to you last week. If somebody posts something negative about you on Facebook, don't go and try to defend that thing. Just go and live out your faith of truth, and that truth of living out will deny any falsehood that anyone could ever speak about you. I can't tell you, and I, I hate to even say this because I don't want to bring any light to this. I can't tell you how many times things have been said about me that were vehemently ugly and false, untrue. They were hurtful. And you know what I had to do? I just had to take that to Jesus, and I bowed my heart and sometimes even wept over it with my wife and my family. But let me tell you something. When I stood up, I stood up in truth because I know who I am. I know who I'm, who I've trusted. I know how much I love folks. I know that that's an ugly thing. But rather than, but rather than going after that and saying, hey, that's not who I am. Why don't I just show that when I see him the next time? Don't turn away from him and act ugly. Go up and say, hey man, it's good to see you. And don't even bring it up. Matter of fact, I told y'all before one of the greatest things that ever happens to me is if I see you out in public and you look like you want to avoid me, you're going to get a hug. <laughs> and so if you're watching today and you don't like a brother, don't you turn and walk around the other way. I'm coming to give you a hug. <laughs> you say, Mark, do you really do that? Yes, I do. And yes, I will. 
But I say that in, in just joking. But here, here's the thing. Truth need not be defending. Truth will defend itself. Let it. C- can I say something? I think we, how many of y'all remember the, the years of MySpace? Y'all remember MySpace? I'm looking around to see how old y'all are. <laughs> I remember MySpace and, and this idea that it birthed with social media is that it belonged to you and you could do whatever and say whatever. Do you know there's people with Facebook today that still believe that? Can I tell you something, child of God? Shame on you. Shame on you. If you start to act like a complete knucklehead on Facebook and then show up and act like nobody saw it, everybody saw it. And if you got somebody out there talking crazy and you involve yourself in the crazy, you're crazy. You just became crazy. I mean, you just got to be. Anyway, just shine the light of Jesus on. But here's another thing. What can I do? Remember I shared this with you in Acts chapter 20. It's one of the most favorite verses in all of the scripture. Found in Acts chapter 20, verses 22 through 24. And I think we have this verse. And this is another thing. is what moves you? What, what, what is it that truly moves you as a man or a woman of God? What moves you? I don't want that to be rhetorical. I really want you to internalize that today and answer the question in your spirit. What is it that drives you, that makes you live and move and breathe? What is it that moves you? The Apostle Paul said in Acts chapter 20, verses 22 and 24 through 24, he said, And see now, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem. Not knowing the things that await me there. He says, except that I know this, that the Holy Spirit will testify in every city. Saying that chains and tribulations await me. He's saying, I've been to Jerusalem before. I've been flogged. I've been beaten. I've been stoned. I've been in prison. I know it's not going to be a good day. But he said, but none of these things move me. Neither do I count my own life dear unto myself, that I may finish my course with joy. What is it that moves you? If hateful people move you, you're in for a most difficult existence as a child of God. Do you know that's why the Bible calls peace that God offers you a peace that passes understanding. Everyone turned against you. Do this. If everyone that is close to you today turned against you, but you are still a child of the Most High God, would he be enough? Because how many of you know friends come and go? How many of you even know sometimes relationships, they're birthed, And they also have an ending. How many of you know that? How many of you know that, uh, here's one for you. How many of you know sometimes those relationships that you thought once defined you, the best thing ever happened is when God allowed that separation of that relationship. You see, sometimes God is doing things that we can't see. So what I want you to hear today is this. And I told you, this is where I left it off last week. There are some people in your life that are absolutely toxic to everything that you're trying to become as a child of God. And if Jesus told his disciples, I want you to go into this city and go door to door, and I want you to testify the glory of who I am. But if they do not receive you, which he's really saying if they don't receive me, then he said this, shake the dust off your feet and move on. I want somebody to hear me today. Somebody needs to be set free in this moment. You have tried, and you have tried, and you have tried, and you have tried. God's telling you today, shake the dust off your feet and move on. Well, Mark, I tell you what, I'm so glad you said that. I'm going to tell my husband to hit the road. I'm not talking about your marriage. (laughs) Walk in, and Mark said to shake the dust on my feet. Get out. That's not what I'm saying. You press on. You lean in. God's got a plan for that. I'm talking about friendships. I'm talking about coworkers. I'm talking about somebody 
you know what I'm talking about. Someone who has become absolutely and utterly toxic in your life. Sometimes it's best to kind of move on. But let me ask you this. How can hateful people refine you as a child of God? I want somebody to hear today these words that I want you to speak over your life. I want you to really internalize this. I think sometime that hateful people out there in the community think that when they spew their hate that they are holding me hostage to that lie. Or they, they think that the thing that they've spoken about you has, is, is, like, is like shooting bullets at you and it's wounding you. I want you to know today that you can allow that to be the storyline or you can take it, internalize it, be reminded of who you were before you were saved, be reminded of how much you need prayer. Because let me tell you something. If you're being attacked by the enemy of people, can I tell you, you might just be doing something right for the glory of God. You might just count it all joy and and push on through and realize that part of what you're going through is part of what God is taking you through. The trial of your faith is worth more than gold that perishes when tried by fire. Stop pushing back from it and lean in and embrace it and say, though he slay me, yet shall I trust in him. And see what God's trying to say to you in that moment. See, your lies can't hold me hostage unless I give them give authority to it. They're not armament to defeat me. Let me tell you what hate does to me. Hate is like fuel to my spirit, saying all the more there's reason for me to rise up even taller. Don't you dare hold your head down because somebody's spewing hate and cruelty towards you. Take that thing to the feet of Jesus and let it control your anger. Let it motivate you. Let it be an example of what you cannot become. Stay humble, stay praying, and watch God do something great. And then where I want to part today. Is what can I learn? You see, God is not arbitrarily allowing things to come into your life just because. If he is the God who a sparrow cannot fall to the earth without him knowing about it and allowing it, and how much more does he love you and I as greatest of all of his creation? Then can I tell you something? Anything that comes into your existence, into your world, God has known about it, and he's allowing it for a greater purpose. What is that purpose? Why, Mark, if I have shaken the dust off my feet, is that person still there? I'm glad you asked. What if? What if you are the only one on planet Earth that God has called and ordained to win that person out of hate and into the glorious light. Let that sink in just a moment. Because now, it's almost like I, I'm going to go backwards and recant what I said about moving on from toxic people. I'm not. I'm just telling you this. There has been times in my life where I turned the page and, and I thought it was over. But God said, oh, no, no, no. That's not a period that you're placing right there. That's a comma. I'm not done with him and I'm not done with you yet. You, you thought it was over, but really what I allowed you to do is go through that season of walking away and regaining your strength. Now I want to send you back into the fight. I jotted a few things down. First of all, by coexisting with hateful people. Remember the story, the parable, that the wheat has to coexist with the weeds. But here's what I wrote down. is It reminds me, and it should remind you, of who I would be without Jesus. I, I think, Tommy, sometimes I feel like people have forgotten who they were before they were a child of the king. You know, the Pharisees, we, we give them a bad rap in Scripture, don't we? We look at them and say, man, I can't believe that they're so self-righteous. Let me say this in love. Please hear my heart. I would say probably 80% of Christians in churches today are some of the most self-righteous people that you will ever encounter because they have forgotten where they came from. I don't say that to condemn you or to judge you. I, listen, I've been that person. 
But let me tell you something. If, if, if God delivered you of something and you can walk past a person who's struggling in, in addiction, shame on you, man. You forgot where you were. Hey, hey, if your marriage is doing great, praise the Lord, hallelujah, you ought to be shouting right now. But can I remind you of that day when you felt like walking out on him? Can I remind you of that day where you felt like marrying her was the worst decision of your life, but God somehow has took that thing and brought it back in and made it sweet? Let's not be forgetful and learn how to not be, be a hater ourselves. First Peter uh, 2, 1 through 2 says it this way. Therefore, rid yourselves of every kind of evil and deception, hypocrisy, Jealousy. You see something somebody's got and you want, and we're all jealous at some points in our life. All of us. You see that guy who killed that big buck and all those other guys going, man, he, he, think, he thinks he's something. Doug Riddick. <laughs> I use that as a good illustration. Doug, Doug killed a nice deer last year. But you know what? He spent a lot more time invested in trying to get that deer. Now, you can apply that to anything. Guess what? You see somebody walking around, and, and, and she's all fit, and her makeup's perfect. Her face is glowing. You know, it just makes you sick. You know what I'm talking about. And you look at her, you say, man, she thinks she's something. And you're walking around, she thinks she's sweet. <laughs> she, that girl, I tell you, she just thinks she's something. No, she's getting up at 4 a.m. and she's going to the gym and she's eating peanuts for breakfast and she's drinking a shake for lunch. Let me tell you something. It's cost her a lot. Hey, I got one for you. Let's put all this stuff like that aside. You see that man or woman walking in and they got their head held high and they're walking into church. Hey, how are you doing? God bless you. They're walking in. Hey, can I pray for you? Man, I was thinking about you today. Or maybe they write a sweet card and they send it to you. Or, or at the end of the service, and I invite people down, my prayer warriors. I invite my prayer warriors to come down. And, and she gets up from back there, and she walks down. She's just so proper. She feels to go pray for some folks. You look at her and go, she thinks she's something. Let me tell you something. There's a real good chance that he or she got in the condition that they were with the Lord because they went through literal hell on earth. Don't you dare. Don't you dare stand in judgment of somebody. Who has landed where you want to be? Why don't you take the same 24 hours in the day and you keep fighting and you become who you're supposed to be? And quit blaming somebody else through jealousy and pride and let that thing take root and destroy you. You've got the same time in the day that he or she does. It's all in how you use it. And if you're not setting yourself up to succeed, you are setting yourself up to fail. Quit dreaming, quit blaming, quit holding everyone else accountable. Take responsibility for who you are or who you are not, and you step up in the power of the Holy Spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that can set you free, that can break addictions, that can make you a new person. Today, all things passed away. Behold, all things become new. You can be who you want to be in Christ, but you got to choose to do it. Be reminded also as Keith makes his way back out. Be reminded of those people who are hurtful and hateful. They're not your enemy. Look to your neighbor right now and tell them this. Look at them real close and say, you know that girl you don't like or guy? Go ahead and fill in the blank. Go ahead and tell them. Engage one another. Here's brotherly love. Say, you know that person you don't like. Some of y'all are going, yeah, I know who you're talking about. I want you to say this to them. Get real close. Get in that little area and look at them and say, they're not your enemy. <laughs> Some of y'all look like y'all ready to fight each other. You don't know her like I know her. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. My goodness, that sums it up. Look, look at the verse. Y'all kind of move your eyes for just a moment. Look at the verse. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. That is humanity. That person you despise that is so cruel and so hateful, they are not your enemy. Stop making them your enemy. But against principalities and powers. 
against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I wrote this down last night as I was sitting there waiting for my grandson to get to my house, and I wrote this down. You and I are in direct conflict and war against the enemy himself, personified in people that he is using. When we finally realize the hateful people, the cruel people, the backbiters, the condemning, the jealous, they are not our enemies. We will finally realize that God has strategically placed them in our life to be a light in a dark world for them. Mark, they don't deserve Jesus. Yes, they do. You do not want to live your life thinking that anybody deserves hell. Don't ever land in that place because now, if you've landed there, no matter how cruel or hateful anyone in this life has ever been to you, they still deserve, and I say this loosely, but they still deserve what you got, and that is grace, unmerited favor, which means that you yourself didn't get what you deserve because if you got what you deserve, you too would be separated from God. So if you get grace... And they're still in your life. Maybe God's trying to tell you, you're the one. You're the one. You're the one that's going to change them. How am I going to change her, Mark? You're going to love her. I'm going to give you an application today, and then we're going home. This is where it all culminates for us as a pastor. If I fail at this point, Keith, I I literally fail you. So this is not on you. This is on me relinquishing and allowing the Holy Spirit to use the frailty and, 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 and everything that is weak in me to bring home a point so that you can leave here and you will invoke life change today. That's my goal. It's a big goal. And here it is. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 and 14, and I'm done. I want you to know that I'm speaking to you. Not you corporately, not you watching online, but I want everybody to do this. Everybody, come on, everybody. I'm speaking to you. You have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. You have been a believer so long now, you ought to be praying with people. You have been in the family of the Most High God for so long now, you should be sharing your faith with others. You you can't. You cannot. Be a child of the Most High God forever changed. And you have Jesus. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And think that just walking through these doors and having a seat and thinking that I'm going to feed you for a moment and then you're going to go back out and God is somehow pleased with that. Paul said, man, you've been a believer so long now, you ought to be turning that back into something and teaching other people. But instead... You need someone to continue to teach you again the basic things of God's Word. You know what you are? You know what you are. Not my words. So if you get upset today, throw it up there. Just throw up these verses and you were like babies who need milk. And you cannot eat solid food. You're a baby. There it is. I said it. You're a crybaby. You're a child. Paul said, you know, when I was a child, I think as a child. But when I became an adult, I became a man. I put away childish things. Some of you guys need to hear me loud and clear today because what I'm saying to you, God has already spoken to me. You know what he's saying, child of God, Christian? It's time to grow up. Quit being a baby. Here's what the verse really looks like. Mark 
Mark, I'm coming to church. That looks silly, Mark. You, you shouldn't do that. Well, it's better than what the story really means. You know what the story's really saying? You're like a baby still nursing on your mother's breast. And the reality is you're only gleaning from her the nutrition she's putting into herself. It's time you start eating on your own. It's not up to your pastor to make sure your spiritually nu nutrition is there for you. you got to feast on him, man. you got to hunger and thirst after him. If you, if you come in here each week and you just sip on the milk of God's Word and I pat you on the back and give you a nice little sermonette and you go outside and smoke a cigarette and you go hang out in this world and you, I'm not speaking to you guys that smoke, I'm saying the reality is as you go out and you do nothing for the glory of God, you're just like a baby. And then what happens when you get hungry? You cry and you come back on Wednesday and I pop it right back in your mouth. And then you go back on Thursday and Friday and you cry. It was sermon the other day wasn't really for me. And then I'll pop it back in your mouth. And you keep living your life like that. I just need some folks to say, you know what? Just like my little baby, at some point, I need some solid food. I need me a big old greasy pizza loaded. I need that thing dripping with cheese. I need it. I, you know what? Y'all bear with me. There comes a point. That this will no longer satisfy That I got to have me a big old honking loaded down hot extra cheese loaded down pizza with a big old tall Pepsi Cola with ice. <laughs> Here's the application. How do you put this down? Maybe for you it's not a pizza. Maybe it's a big old 24 ounce porterhouse. Medium rare. So be it. Here's what I want you to do. Realize you've been in the faith long enough that now you should start doing something for the glory of God. Mark, what do I do? Start with that hateful, cruel person and win them to Jesus. Start with the thing that God has placed in your life. Mark, you don't, you don't understand. My marriage is almost over. start there Mark you don't understand I hate my job the Bible says all authority that's in your life has been placed in your life and ordained by God for a time Mark I was um, delivered of addiction and get involved in a celebrate recovery program and start teaching somebody else young ladies women do you remember when you had no identity as a young girl, but now you're a strong woman of God because now you know who you are and you know whose you are. Titus says that you're to go back and you're to teach the younger ladies on how to walk. Men, every man in the room, I need you to stand up. Every man in this room. If you're not standing and you're a male, time to put the bottle down, men. Time to start eating the meat of this life. Tomorrow night we're going to have a man-to-man -man meeting. Six o'clock. We're not going to have bottles for everybody when they walk in the door. We're going to have bacon. We're going to have grits, eggs, and biscuits, and syrup. And then we're going to pray together. And it will change your life if you'll let it. You've been a Christian, sir, way too long to just allow stuff to come and traipse in and out of your home and in and out of your life. If your marriage is not working, it's your fault. If your home is not right with God, it's on you. That's not my words. You're the head of your home, even as Christ, the head of the church. So, man, I'm asking you to come tomorrow. This is your first step of your faith. Because you remember a minute ago when I had everybody stand up and said, let me see who all is serving. Do you know what percentage of people in our church and in every church that I've ever been in is serving? About 15% at best. What would happen if you started serving? 
I tell you, I don't like the way this is. Well, then get involved and change the thing you don't like. All the one, women, please stand. Grab your fella by the arm, so proud. That's your fella. Young people, y'all stand. Young people, stand. Need everybody lift their left hand. And everybody lift your right hand at the same time. <laughs> Wherever you go in this swirl, that says, I give up. I surrender. You know what God wanted me to tell you today? He needs your full surrender. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Will you do it? Mark, I don't know what to do. Come and pray. Mark, I don't know how to get plugged in. Give it to Jesus. How many of you can say, Mark, I know that I know that I know that I'm a child of the Most High God. Lift your hand right now. Lift it up high. Some hands did not go up. Everyone can put your hands down. What are you waiting for? This is your moment. This is your day. Pray with me from your heart to God. Father in heaven, I am a sinner. I believe in Jesus. I want to ask Jesus to come into my heart to forgive me. Jesus, save me. Be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you pray that in prayer, hey, keep your heads down for a moment. If you pray that in faith today, right now, lift your hand up. Lift it up high. I prayed and invited Jesus. I say hands are going up all over the room. What I want you to do on the count of three, if you got your hand up, I want you to come right now. You're not going to say anything. You're not joining anything. I want you to come down at this altar. We just want to pray with you right now. One, two, three, come. If you prayed, I want you to just start walking right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Just move out. Maybe the hardest thing you've ever done, but it'll be the thing that changes your life the most. How many of you can say, Mark, I absolutely heard from the Lord today, and I want to be used by God. I want to take a step forward. Hold your hand up, church. Hold it up. Come on. Let me see. I'm just looking. Then I want you to find a place up against this wall, this altar. I want you to bring your family. I want you to say, God, we're going to lay our family at your feet. We're going to trust you today. While Keith sings, I need some daddies to take their family to the altar. I need some husbands to take their wife and bathe their marriage in prayer. I need mamas to stand up and grab that husband by the hand and say, we're going to pray today. Whatever it takes. Young people, I'm challenging you today. If nothing else, God just spoke to your heart. I want you to come shake my hand, turn around and walk away. Just to say, God, I heard from you. Keith, y'all sing?